Welcome to Sports Save My Life. My name is Clayton Freck, and I'm the CEO and founder of Angel City Sports. We know the power of sport to change and in some cases save lives. We hear these compelling stories every day, and we created this show to share them with the world. Enjoy the show, and remember to like, follow, share, and comment. All right. Today, I have the distinct pleasure of interviewing Angel City Sports athlete number zero, Ezra Freck, who also happens to be my eldest son. Ezra was born a congenital amputee and learned to walk on a prosthetic leg when he was 11 months old. He's always loved sports, and he's been an athlete his entire life, playing just about every sport he could find, especially what I think was his first love, was basketball. He found track and field at the age of eight and holds dozens of national youth records. He made the U.S. Paralympic track and field team as a 14-year-old in 2019. He attended the Junior World Championships. He won two silvers at the Pan American Games in Peru and was also in the finals in all three of his events at the World Championships in Dubai. That's long jump, high jump, and the 100 meter. He's been a media darling since he was four years old when he first appeared on Good Morning America. When he was, I think, about 10, he was a Sports Illustrated Kid of the Year finalist, and he appeared on the Ellen DeGeneres show. Uh, He's a motivational speaker and has addressed crowds uh, of 17,000 people and up. Uh, But most importantly for me, he's a true disability advocate and mentor to children and adults really all over the world who find inspiration and motivation uh, from him and his story. Uh, And I know this because I help him manage his schedule, but he gives his time generously to, you know, schools and Angel City and really any organization that is doing good work in the community. So Ezra, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me, dad. Happy to be on here. (laughs) All right. So what comes to mind when you hear the title of the show, Sports Save My Life? Um, first of all, I like the title. Uh, I like the name of it for sure. And it applies to, to me as well as many of the other athletes who are involved with Angel City. Um, because in many ways, sports did save my life. And I'm sure it saved hundreds and hundreds of athletes, um, especially a lot of the, the people that you know, you've been able to talk to. What first comes to mind um, it's just uh, it's it's it perfectly encaptures everything we do at Angel City and puts it into a, a, a nice catchy title. So nice job, whoever whoever came up with that. <laughs> All right. So envision this. Where would you who would as a frack be without sport? I don't know. That's a difficult thing to think of because sports has played uh, such a huge role in my life ever since I was so young. I mean, you know, it better than anyone, but. I genuinely don't know. I, I don't even know how to answer that question. I mean, I, 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 I don't know what to say. I don't know who, I don't think I would be anywhere near the type of person that I am today. I, I say it even when I, there's times where I'm unable to train or, you know, we get, we go on vacation and I don't have a track to train at or a place to work out at. I, I feel jittery. I don't feel like myself. So I don't even know how to answer that question. <laughs> Tell me what you can answer one of two questions. What is it? mean to you like in your heart what does sport mean to you or like what is the feeling or the emotions that you get when you're on the field or on the track or in the game or whatever yeah for sure I think well I'll sort of kind of answer them both a little bit I think growing up the meaning of sport to me was a way to escape you know my disability and escape the sort of uh the barriers that I had you know were placed on me as a young kid because I mean growing up with disability I was stared at 24 7 People were pointing fingers, whispering. I mean, there's so much to go into there, but it was difficult. It's difficult on a young kid who didn't have necessarily the same confidence that I have today. And so sports was a place where I could go where I wasn't looked at as a kid with disability, right? I was just sort of the basketball player. I was scoring points. I'm not thinking about the fact that I'm the only kid in my school with one leg, right? Or the only kid in my grade missing fingers. Um, So when I was younger, I just had, I, I loved to be competitive and compete against my friends. And on top of that, there was this underlying theme where like I was able to forget my disability for a second and just be a kid, be an athlete. Um, now, as I've gotten older, that sort of role of sports has become a little bit more serious to me, especially as track and field has expanded as, you know, becoming one of my favorite, be- becoming my favorite sport and taking it very more, a lot more seriously. 
it's now um, it's looked at as sort of like a, not a job, like a job, but like a fun job. Like, so I'm enjoying like my passion, something I love to do. Um, and I love being competitive and, and I love saying, you know, I want to want to be the best. And so now the, the motivation and the meaning of sports as well as still similar that to that escape that I had when I was younger, it is now more of like a, like a competitive thing and something I do as like almost like a profession. Yeah, no, it is, it is for you. Uh, why don't you give me in one sentence, like who, who you are? <laughs> That's so tough. Um, <laughs> I'm as a freck and I'm, uh, I'm a future Paralympian disability advocate, motivational speaker, and, uh, someone who wants to change the way people with disabilities are looked at globally. So. Yeah. Beautiful. That's <laughs> where is that I, I don't know that was just i've never i never had that question really asked before i just didn't know it <laughs> i know people don't like it it's hard <laughs> all right all right so so start we both kind of you know put a couple data points on the map already but start from you know ground zero um you know explain your 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 disability you were born different right and you know, talk to me about, you know, your childhood and kind of upbringing and, and really more focused on, you know, kind of the disability journey. Yeah, yeah, for sure. I was basically born with one finger on my left hand and I had a lower left leg that was curved in towards my waist. And at two and a half years old, I had a surgery, a 15 hour procedure where the doctors removed the curved part of my left leg and then they transplanted the big toe from my former left leg that was curved in and put it onto my left hand. And, you know, as you know, dad, growing up, I loved all sports. I loved everything being active. Um, I mean, I learned to count by twos before ones from watching Laker games. Basketball is my favorite sport growing up. And, um, you know, going back to the surgery, the surgery made such a huge impact on my life because I had a leg that was curved in, couldn't really fit into a prosthetic to now a stump that can fit into a prosthetic leg. Now I have two fingers, you know, opposed to one finger that you can't hold stuff. Yeah, I was holding everything against my chest. I got a second finger. I could pick things up. I could hold things. So that surgery changed my life. And um, as sports, sports played a huge role in that as well. You know, me growing up and, and having something to look forward to, being able to connect with, you know, a lot of the kids in my grade and a lot of the kids that I was friends with. Um, but as far as the disability journey goes, you know, as, as much as I'd love to say it was a very smooth process and I just sort of played sports and figured everything out and I was totally fine. And there was nothing really that was different because I was sort of I was able to infiltrate into the mainstream sports that a lot of the kids in my grade played. Um, there's lots of ups and downs, as anyone with disability will will attest to, you know, growing up, I felt like an outsider everywhere I went and I was the only kid in my school with one leg. I wasn't really around many people with physical disabilities besides when we went to certain events like the Challenge Athletes Foundation or maybe like an occasional get together with some, someone else who had a physical disability. But all my friends weren't to say, well, we, uh, no, no, no one in my family had a physical disability. So I felt like an outsider. And also it was difficult because, you know, I was being stared at 24 seven everywhere I went. Yep. People pointing fingers, whispering, this four-year-old kid is now the center of attention everywhere and not necessarily in a positive way. Not like, Oh my God, like he's so cute or something like that. Like, Oh, Whoa, that he has one leg. Like, wow. He's like, a, he has a robot, robot, robotic leg. Like right. it wasn't in a positive light. And so having that and everywhere I went and it was never off of me and that people were all, I always felt the eyes on me um, definitely took a lot out of me. And, and I, you know, I, we had conversations when I was younger, I'd be like, why was I born like this? Like, why did this happen to me? And it wasn't this, as how do you think all of the pointing and the staring and the whispering, like, how did that affect, how did it affect you? Did it, did it alter your personality? Did it, what, like, what, what did it do to you? I don't know. If, I don't know if it altered my personality. The way I like to think about it is like, it was kind of like, it's kind of like this. They were all like little small blows, little small punches, right? Mm -hmm. To a very young kid who, and it sort of toughened me up a little bit to the point now where like stuff just like doesn't really bother me, right? Like mm -hmm. I I don't really like, I, I, I'm like, I'm like rubber sheet metal right on the outside. Like people, you could do whatever. I'm just getting hit. I don't feel it. You know what I mean? And so, so, so it's given you 
I don't know if it's given you resilience across the board, but it's given you some resilience to those little blows that you just have been withstanding your whole life. Yeah. I mean, you, like, I was like a soft little four-year-old kid and then I'm getting stared at, pointed fingers at people talking about my disability. I feel it all the time. You just become used to it because it's every day, 24 seven until the point where like that stuff doesn't bother you. And now when I go out in public, I don't even notice that people are staring at me. People around me are like, dude, do you notice that like there's a bunch and I'm like, oh, I like I just I don't I don't even realize it anymore because it happens so much. That's funny. Uh, well, yeah, because uh, when you're younger, we were very aware of it, right? Um, so, yeah. what kind of kid were you? Uh, I was I was a really active kid. Um, I mean, you could probably answer this better than anyone, but I was uh, I I was super energetic and. And my passion was sports, which is so funny. And it's, we've said, said a hundred times, but it's true. Like I was just an athletic sporty kid growing up. Yeah. Um, despite the disability and despite all the other stuff that goes on, I was just a kid who loved to compete, loved to be active. So. Yeah. All right. So talk to me. I, I have a theory that parents are like the hidden heroes of the Paralympic movement, maybe the adaptive and disability movement and more broadly. And I don't want to portray myself as a hero, but like, talk to me about the role of, you know, your parents, mom and I in, in your journey. Well, I, I agree with you that parents are the hidden heroes within whatever the adaptive sports movement or the Paralympic world, whatever it might be. Cause it, you know, they say the apple doesn't fall far from the tree. And in some cases the apple started pretty far from the tree because you guys didn't really know anything about how to, you know, raise a kid with the physical disability. And well, to be clear, we didn't even know how to raise a kid at all. So, <laughs> and, to, and then on top of that, I had a disability. This, is, this is learning on the job from day one, but yeah, go ahead. Um, but I think that, you know, I, I, I wouldn't say I just was born with this sort of confidence that I could do whatever I wanted and born with this confidence that I was just able to go up and speak to anyone. It was built in through hundreds of hours of you and mom, you know, like drilling it into my head and and ultimately con convincing me that like, I don't need to care what other people think. You know, I can just, my mom used to tell me, just puff my chest out, walk into the room like I own the place. And then now, because she had told me that so many times and because we had talked about this so many times and instilled this confidence within me. Mm -hmm. And, you know, when you guys aren't there holding my hand as a four-year-old walking in, I was still walking in with that same confidence. And so having confidence when you're, someone who is stared at 24 seven and always looked at and like people don't know what to say when you have self-confidence and like this, this, you're not insecure about yourself anymore. When you get to that point, especially with the physical disability, it's a huge milestone because then nothing matters. The person mm -hmm. staring, who cares if the person's whispering, who cares? The person's well, it doesn't matter. Like I, I had this sort of confidence that took some time to get to that point, obviously, mm -hmm. But it was the steps that, you know, you and mom, you know, instilled in me growing up that allowed me to even get there in the first place. So 100 percent, you guys are you guys are the heroes of the story. Sure. <laughs> uh, There's a little bit of a softball, I guess. Um, so. Uh, you you had, you know, one huge surgery, you had another surgery, a follow up surgery. Uh, you probably don't remember those early surgeries, but you have also just a long way had a, a fair amount of medical challenges and issues um you know you're 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 not a stranger right to to sort of medical challenges can you talk talk to me through you know some of those challenges that sort of you know were the were the bigger challenges that you faced yeah and it's interesting because a lot of the medical challenges that i still face to this day they're like re they're reoccurring challenges they're not stuff that just sort of happens and it's going to go away because if it happens once and it's never going to happen again, I wouldn't really consider that much of a challenge, more of just like a, a little bump in the road. These yep. challenges that I face are whether it be skin issues, whether it be, you know, body pain issues from being on a prosthetic, they're all obviously directly late related to, to the fact that I have one leg, um, but they don't go away, right? The skin mm -hmm. issue, you know, have, getting blisters on my sump, never going to go away. When this is something I don't want really to talk about that much, but I, you know, the hair on my stump, sometimes gets curled up and tied into these really tight knots and it pulls my skin, which is another form of skin issue. That's just not going to really go away. I have back pain, the leg, when I grow a little bit, right. My back is thrown off or something happens and I'm wearing something that maybe throws my hips off back pain. That's a body, body issue. That's never going to go away. 
all these little things, like even the prosthetic legs breaking and things moving and my leg getting bigger and we're adjusting sockets and we're, like, it, all that stuff is never going to go away. So as well, far as the like, word, the word that comes to mind as you're talking about this is the permanence. Yeah. Of these issues like yeah. this is a permanent disability that you're facing. There's no rehab that changes, right? What you're there's no, you there's no rehab. Yeah, there's no right? rehab. And, and, and it's hard. Life as an amputee is hard. There are. I mean, right. I mean, how often are you in the prosthetic clinic? I mean, you know, we're, thank God we're hair we're is so good, right? <laughs> yeah, all the time. And I, and I think it's cool because like, there's things I can do to prevent these types of things. Like there's, I can wash my leg very well. I can do, but at the end of the day, like some of it's just inevitable and it's going to happen. And I just gotta be like, whatever, like, okay, this happens, you know? So it's like a, it's a weird balance between like trying to avoid it. But then if it happens, you're just like, what can you do? You know? Right. Um, talk to me about the, you know, the darkest moment for you in your life so far. Uh, I would say the darkest moment in my life so far would be when I fractured my femur and uh, I had to be in, in a wheelchair for three months. I couldn't put any weight on my right leg. And that was really, I was, I was, I was in sixth grade and this is actually, it's a pretty funny story because it kind of relates to what's going to happen this summer, but I was in sixth grade and I had just watched the, the Rio 2016 Paralympics and I got so motivated and I realized like, that's what I want to do with my life that I just started training like every day, knowing nothing about what to train, just wanting to jump and run and do whatever and in my backyard at 6 a.m. right before before I go to, you know, do math at, at my school and all these like like it was every sixth grade thing. But I was just like training ridiculously hard. And during recess, I was jumping on these little benches outside of class and and all the pounding that I had put on my right leg as a, such a young kid, not knowing what I was doing and just trying to train, and do everything. Um, I ended up getting a stress fracture in my femur and I couldn't walk for three months. I couldn't put weight on it if I wanted it to heal, if I didn't want to permanently damage my femur going forward. And I was a really active mobile kid. And then boom, in one second, I wasn't walking. I was in a wheelchair. I wasn't, I wasn't playing basketball anymore. I wasn't sprinting on the track. I wasn't high jumping. I wasn't like, it just happened so fast and it hit me like a brick wall. And I was like, whoa. And I felt like my identity had sort of been taken away from me. And like, I wasn't able to do sports. I was in the same way. I was still able to play wheelchair basketball and do some stuff, but I just, I was like, are you like I just didn't feel the same. Um, so that was definitely one of the, the darkest moments of my life. But at the same time, I, I learned so much from that experience, learned what it's like to be in a wheelchair. You learned so much res self-resilience, learned a lot about myself, you know, when you're, you learned a lot about really who my true friends are in sixth grade, because I was late to every class. I was not at recess. I was sitting on the stairs by myself a lot of the time. And I, you know, I had the people who were with me were the people who I'm still friends with to this day. Right. And so, um, it definitely taught me a lot about, you know, my true friends about myself, about the whole, it was, it was a great experience altogether, but as far as the darkest moment of that was definitely one of the darker moments of my life. And, and, you learned a lot about the accessibility of the world, too. Well, yeah. because as an amputee, you don't really understand how inaccessible the world is. Yeah, like I, I don't like going upstairs, but I'm not like going upstairs thinking every time I'm going up like, oh, man, someone in a wheelchair cannot do this. I just right. don't you're not thinking about it when you're in the moment. But then I was in the wheelchair, couldn't get into the car, the house, my school, up the steps, like anywhere, literally anywhere I went, there was something I had to be lifted up or go over it was yeah and what got you through that time period what got me through that time period was just sort of making the, the most of the situation that i was in i was playing wheelchair basketball every tuesday at ucla i was doing like i i, I think my goal was to do like 200 dips a day in the wheelchair so like multiple times throughout the day, I would just pump out like 20 dips on the wheelchair because I had like some handles that were like perfect for them. And I was like doing push-ups, like doing sit-ups, doing the most basic workout stuff. But it meant so much to me because I felt like myself a little bit when I was doing them and I felt active again. And there was a quote too that sort of appeared for you 
right during that time yeah. period that was helpful yeah the quote was uh stars can't shine without darkness and it just so it happened that that year i gave a speech at the school talking about that quote and mm -hmm. then a month or two later i was really experiencing the quote and so you know i, I learned a lot that experience was great learned how to manage load and, and and learned a lot about myself so overall it was a positive experience but obviously you go down before you you know really reach that high point so for sure for sure so i know you do a lot of mentoring um so you, this this should be a an easy answer for you but like what would you tell first time parents that are born with this little guy missing limbs or born with spina bifida or cerebral palsy or any any you know anything like what's what's the learning right what are the learnings that you can can impart to some to new parents um i would say the learnings come down to two things i sports and being active being physically active and then instilling self-confidence in them mm. between those two things you can create this sort of invincibility against everything mm -hmm. right maybe not not everything necessarily because obviously there's some things that it's going to hurt and some things that are might be difficult to process but with those two combined together it creates this this self-confidence and this this ability and belief in in oneself so like for for like talking going back to what i was saying earlier about you and mom instilling this confidence and then also me being active the combination of those two things not only allowed me to make friends and and you know and connect with other kids in my grade and other people in general in a way that i wasn't able to before it taught me a lot about myself and then on top of that i had this confidence that i was like to right. walk in and own the room and just be myself and who cares what these other people think like i know me i'm confident within myself and it's hard to get to that point and, and it takes lots of you know ups and downs and you know crying about this and figuring this out but eventually when 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 you know if you have a parent you're a parent who just had a baby born with a physical disability, you know, getting them active, getting them outside and, and helping them follow their passions, whether that might be sports, whether that might be art, whether that might be music, whatever it might be. But then on top of that, instilling this confidence in them that like their disability shouldn't be holding them back from doing the things that they're passionate about. So the, I would, I would change it actually from, from being active, following their passions, and then instilling self-confidence. The combination of those three things, mm -hmm. I think will create, um, will create a child that'll, you know, be much better off when they get to the real world and are not, you know, necessarily next to their parents 24 seven when they're on their own and they're doing their own thing. If they have those three combined and they've, they've grown up that way, they'll be fine. So I like your change to it to add the, the, the third, because for you, it just happens to be that being physically active is your passion, but it, it could well have been anything else, right? That's not well than anything else. I think being physically active, I think that's a necessity, regardless of what the passion is. Right. I think there's ways to do that, that, you know, is cut more connected to the passion, right? Whatever that might be, but, you know, following your passion, being physically active and, you know, and, and, and then having self-confidence are arguably three of the most important things you could have, especially for a children with the physical, for children with physical disabilities growing up, because yes. you know, a lot of them lack that self-confidence that is built in from whether it's, you know, maybe, maybe being good at their passion or finding a few friends when they're, you know, at playing, doing this sport or doing this, being active, whatever it might be, they all feed into each other and then end up feeding into the self-confidence goal. So it all comes together. For sure. For sure. Let's take a quick break to learn more about the equipment loaner program at Angel City Sports. Part of our mission at Angel City Sports is to eliminate all barriers to participation in adaptive sports. Providing free adaptive sports equipment is a major component to this objective. Each individual piece of equipment can cost more than $3,000. Can you imagine if running shoes cost that much? So we're building an inventory of adaptive sports equipment to support our clinics, competitions, partner programs, and to loan out to emerging local athletes. Currently, we have racing wheelchairs, throwing chairs, and sport wheelchairs, perfect for tennis and basketball. If you or an athlete you know need a piece of adaptive sports equipment, visit the Equipment Opportunities page at angelcitysports.org. If you are interested in donating equipment or supporting the Equipment Loaner Program, email us at info at angelcitysports.org. So, 
list me all the sports that you've done, you know, growing up. And I want you to also give me some specifics about basketball and what really what basketball meant to you growing up. Yes. Okay. I'll try to say every sport that I've done. <laughs> um, I remember, well, if, remember, if, I don't know. if I'm forgetting one of them, say, but uh, basketball, soccer, football, uh, karate, swimming. Um, I did skateboarding for a little bit. Um, oh, baseball. Baseball. Surfed. So I surfed a little bit. Um, track and field, obviously. Yeah. Uh, um, I played wheelchair basketball a little bit. Um, I think that's it, but I'm probably forgetting one or two of them. Yeah. Something like that. But okay. um, back to the role, the role of basketball that it played in my life. Basketball was arguably like my first love in the sports world. It, it was my first love in the sports world. And it, it, it opened me up to this sort of world where I wasn't looked at as the kid with disability. Um, Cause I, I happened to be very good at it. I love the sport. I worked really hard. You know, I, I played basketball all the time. I lived, I breathed, I thought basketball, I watched it on TV 24 seven. And when you immerse yourself in something so heavily, even at such a young age, you're going to be good at it because you love to play the sport. So you're going to play it and therefore you're training and becoming better. And so I just became pretty good at basketball for the average, whatever it might be, fourth grader, fifth grader. And because I became so invested in, in basketball and became so good at it, um, I was able to, people were able to separate, you know, I wasn't just known as the, the kid with one leg at my school. I sort of had like, you know, I made friends on the basketball team. You know, we played basketball together. I was like this really good player. They weren't saying, oh, Ezra's the, the kid with one leg. Oh, Ezra's the basketball player. The, the best kid who plays basketball, that kid. So having that to sort of separate myself from this, this whole idea that I was like the kid with disability or like the kid to feel sorry for or yep. the kid who everyone's like, oh, how are you doing, buddy? Like, no, like, let's go play basketball. Like, I'll, I'll beat you. Like, I'll destroy. Like, that's really <laughs> so having, having that, it made such a huge impact because like, kids who felt sorry for me were now trying their best to guard me. And I was still scoring uh, granted this was third and fourth grade. So not that big of a deal, but it's like in, in, for me and my, my confidence and moving forward and my, you know, how I felt it, it was great to have people who would feel sorry for me. Usually like feel sorry for me in the game. Don't guard me. Okay. I'll just shoot it. You know what I mean? It was like, yeah. it was like the perfect combination of, of people fearing, so feeling sorry and then getting flipped. Like, Oh, like I actually have to play basketball against, I get to play defense. So. And, and talk to us a little bit about your, your journey uh, in club basketball. Cause I feel like that, that was a really kind of a, it was multiple moments, right? Good and bad. But like, there was a bunch of moments in there that, that, that you grew a lot through. Yeah. Club basketball. Well, I had been playing what school basketball the whole time. So I hadn't really played like hardcore, like physical basketball. and you know yeah you grew up playing you know rec with my friends rec and then school which wasn't super competitive you're always like one of the better players on the court but i mean it wasn't super competitive yeah it wasn't super competitive and then i transitioned to club and i think i tried out for one team i didn't make it we tried out for another team i, I made the team and it was just different it was like oh wow this is like really serious and you know i was grateful to have an amazing coach in in brian halusim shout out brian who really believed in me and not many people believe that a kid with one leg could play elite level club basketball. Yeah. It's just, it, I look awkward doing it. I'm not moving the same way. There's some things that I'm not going to be as good on, right? I might not be the best defender moving to the left, right? But going to the right, you know, I'll, I'll force you to the right. So you have to end up going my way. I, I, there was just little things that I wasn't able to do as well, but I made up for it and other things and the way I, and so he was, I, I started off not playing very much. I started off really like I didn't find my role on the team. I was, I was showing up every practice. I was still working very hard, but I hadn't really broken through to, to make the, the lineup, make the, the rotation. And then, you know, over time, I was just able to sort of crack the rotation. You know, they started to realize that they could use me in certain situations. And, and then ultimately I ended up playing, you know, for what it was almost a year of, of pretty serious club basketball playing all these tournaments, you know, starting in some games. And, and if I wasn't starting, you know, I, I actually didn't start that often, 
because Brian, the coach, he said he wanted me to come off the bench. I was like this secret weapon that he, he, my secret weapon is what he called me where I would come off the bench. They wouldn't be expecting anything. And then I would go out and they score like however many points and play this amazing game and shock them. And so he liked to bring me off the bench more, but it didn't matter. I was still playing the same amount of minutes. I was still shocking people that I was on one leg, you know, playing better than, you know, majority of the players on the other teams and stuff. So that was, that was pretty cool for me to sort of have that little breakthrough and like stun people and shock people once again. Right. Yeah. And, and I, I feel like it did a lot for your self-confidence too. You know, you, you, you're already a really confident kid, but I feel like it was just like this extra boost. Uh, it was just, it was just very self, it was self reassuring. I was like, yeah, I was like, I did that. I play club basketball and I'll fuck, I'll, I'll just, I'll just throw you on one leg like that. Yeah. That's what, that's me. Like, that's what I do. That's, that was what it felt like. It was like, I think it's, it's a little hard to appreciate how hard that is as an above knee amputee, you know, um, you know, like you didn't have a knee, right. You know, to really be able to, to squat and bend down. So like a lot of the movements in basketball are in a crouch position. And so you had to do things very differently. So I just think that's it's just for the, the sort of the, the listener. Right. Um, so let's, let's shift to Paralympic sport and talk to me a little bit. So talk to me a little bit about getting your first running blade and then kind of there, there was, you know, a gap between then and when you sort of just started to take track a little more seriously, but sort of give us your, your journey in track starting when, when you first got that running blade. Yeah. My journey in track is pretty weird because I sort of, I did track for fun recreationally during the same time where I was playing basketball and even playing club basketball. And so I was favoring basketball much more than track. And then something sort of flipped and I began to realize that like track is like, I actually see a future. Like I, I could, I could actually do that. I'm not probably not going to make it to the NBA. Right. Cause I, I'm a big believer in setting realistic goals, right. Goals that maybe might seem a little bit crazy, but I genuinely believe they're attainable. I began to realize like, I just don't, I, 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 first of all, I sort of drip, began drifting away from basketball. I didn't realize how much I really loved it anymore. And if it was really for me and I had track that I would actually enjoy doing for fun. And I saw a future there. I saw a place pretty close that I was almost like that I was in reach, you know, it was an attainable goals. And so I sort of made this transition and then I watched the Rio 2016 Paralympics and fell even more in love and so inspired. And that's boom, it flipped. That's what I'm going to do. Um, but I had gotten the running blade since I was, when I was, I got a running blade and I was four years old. I didn't, I didn't start doing track until I was about eight and we did it for fun. We trained a little bit before these track meets, just went out there, had a good time, very social event, met people, networked. It was like a very fun thing, but I didn't start taking it really seriously until I was like 12, maybe when I realized, or, or actually when I was like 11 or 12, mm -hmm. I was like, I'm going to, I'm going to go to the, the Tokyo Paralympic games. And there's a video of me, you know, somewhere in mom's phone right after watching the Rio 2016 Paralympics of me being like in the backyard, I'm jumping over boxes, I'm working out and I'm like, this is as a fact, this is my first official training session for the 2020 Tokyo Paralympic Games. You'll see me there or something like that. And then now, you know, you look at the timeline of events, like I did club basketball and people were like, whoa, like kid with one leg playing on a club basketball team, like. I made this, I ended up getting in the rotation and being one of the key players on the team. Now this 11 year old kid says he's going to go to the 2020 Tokyo Paralympics at 15 years old. Okay. Mm -hmm. What a, yeah. Now fast forward, I'm in the position where that's actually going to happen and that's something attainable. And so I track has become this sort of, has really been what I, I really, I found. And I was like, this is like, this is what I want to do with my, like, this is it. This is what's, this is me. This is what I'm going to do. This is my passion. Not in the same way where it was basketball, where I did it for fun and I did it. It was, I was passionate about it. This is a different type of passion. This is like a soul, like bigger than me, like a soul connected passion with mm. the Paralympic movement, especially within track and field. So. Well, and, and, you know, you made the U S Paralympic team as a 14 year old, as I mentioned. So talk about that process of making the team, what, what it took to sort of get there and what was that 
feeling like? I mean, it, uh, you know, kind of how did that transpire? Yeah, for sure. It was, you know, what's really funny is I always told myself the way I'm going to set it up is I'm going to make the Para Pan Am team in the year before Tokyo. And then it'll be like a warm up because then in Tokyo, I'll have already went to the Pan American Games. And that's exactly what I did. And then on top of that, I went to the world championships, which I didn't even expect to be, you know what I mean? So, um, but I did, I made the team as a 14 year old. I, well, I actually made it as like about a 13 year old, but then I was competing when I was 14 and I was, but it was, it was a pretty crazy experience being that young traveling the world. And, and I was sort of new to the scene. I was new to all this stuff. I didn't really understand it very well. I was just, I was just there. I didn't understand how the international competition worked and all the stuff, but I, I was grateful to be there. And I, I had knew it was going to happen all along. And so I was just sort of figuring it out, testing the waters um, until eventually, you know, in Tokyo, I'm not going to be testing the waters anymore. I'll have been an experienced veteran at uh, <laughs> these competitions. No, I'm kidding. Yeah. I'll, at I'll, the I'll, ripe old age of 16. At the ripe old age of 16. Exactly. But it was, it was pretty surreal because, you know, like one year before I made the team, I was watching these guys on TV like watching them as if like I'm sitting on my couch they're all the way in whatever country they're in competing for a medal. Yeah. Like not even a year later, I'm in that position. I'm on the TV. I'm right next to these guys who I've studied for years. And I'm like, wow, like it hit me at one, when I was high jumping with all the guys with, you know, with all the Indian guys, with all the Polish guys, you know, I was, I was there and I was just like, all the guys I was competing. I was like, wow. I was like, I'm here. Like this is happening. I watched them on TV for years and years and years. And now I'm here competing against them. I'm a threat to them. It's like, trip me out for a second. Well, I, you know, I mentioned it in the intro, like it's, it's pretty cool that you made the team that year. You're so young and did well at the Pan American games with two silver medals. But then I felt like at world at the world championships, which where you're competing against all these adults, I thought that was a really powerful moment because you made the finals, you know, in, in your three events and uh, describe uh, the hundred meter final, because I just think that's like, a, it's, it's sort of indicative of like, right. You're still just a kid there, you know, yeah. like you're not, yeah. you're not some pro athlete, right? Like you're just a kid. Yeah. Yeah. So for the hundred meter final um, for anyone, you know, who's listening and might understand uh, you run a prelim race. And then you, if you make, if you run fast enough, you are able to compete in the final for a medal. I was right on the cusp. I was the, the slowest guy who, who made the final. I was the last guy. And I was, uh, I was, you know, we, we did the hunt. We did the we're about to do the race. And I'm ready. I'm so excited. I know I'm not going to medal. I was so far behind these guys, but I was just happy to be there. I was enjoying the moment. I think I was like looking around the crowd. I was like feeling it up, you know, like just sort of enjoying the moment and boom, gun went off. I got out really quickly. I got out actually pretty equal with the guys first 20, 30 meters. I wasn't far behind. Then they started to pull away and I just got so tired. I just got hit this wind and I was like, Ugh. and I, I, I didn't really train for the hundred meter that much. I wasn't like, so I was just going downhill and you know, the race happened so fast. But I really was, as much as I was happy to be in the race, I was very curious about who was going to win because I was had, you know, so much built up on this race for these watching these guys. And so as I'm running, I'm about 10 meters from the line and I look up and, and instead of finishing the race and running all out, I just said, screw it. And I just looked over and watched this insane finish of guys like two lanes over. But I just looked up and I just strolled across the line watching them finish. Cause I was just like, I had, I was like, I had to just appreciate the moment just watch. I was like, wow. And then I just went across the line. Cause obviously my time didn't matter that much. I was just there. I was, I was, it was like a split second that I did that, but just being running full speed. And I was just like, whoa. And then I just sort of finished the race. It was so cool. Cause it was arguably one of the best finishes in, you know, Paralympic history for the hundred meter. It was five guys all within less than one tenth of a second. And so I, you know, I, when I looked over, they all went whoo, at once. I was like, whoa, that was crazy. Like I just had to appreciate it for a second. Tokyo will be a different story. I'm, I'm going to be in the pack, you know, getting the other people appreciating, but as a 14 year old having fun, enjoying the moment, I just was running and I was just like, wow, that's like, I just, I, I just, I just watched them finish. It was like that was blown away. It was amazing. I, lo I, lo I love that. I love that. Cause it's like, 
it's like, are you the athlete or are you a fan? Like, are you a spectator? Like, you're like kind of all, all of it mixed. I, in. I said, I got, I got the best, I got the best tickets to the best final. I was there. I was right there. I was next to all the guys. I watched the finish. I saw them celebrate. Like it was as much as cool as it was to be there competing. I was so far away from meddling at the time that it was almost like, this is just a cool experience as yeah. a whole, you know? Yeah. Yeah. I love that. Okay. So let's talk about Tokyo. So, uh, we, you know, the games were postponed. It's been, you know, a year plus, you know, we're going on 14 months in some sort of version of the quarantine lockdowns, social distancing, all this stuff. How has this last, you know, year been for you in just dealing with the pandemic? Uh, and then tell us, like, what is it going to take for you to make the team in, in, you know, and like, what's that process like? Yeah, the pandemic has been pretty crazy. Uh, I, I've been through so many ups and downs throughout this past 14 months or whatever it might be over the year. Um, you know, I, I went through a lot. I learned a lot about myself, went through a lot of, you know, emotional and social struggles, relationship stuff. We, I bounced back and, and you know, I had school in person at, or I just recently got back to school in person. I had, had school online and then I had all this stuff going on. I was super sad. I was in my room all day. So I thought all these ups and downs, but the one thing that stayed consistent was we've been training. Me and my coach Lati have been training throughout this entire time. We didn't really take much time off. Mm. Maybe it took a few weeks when we found out the games were postponed. I sort of sulked. I sat in this all. Oh, I'm sad. So sad, blah, blah. And then we were back at it. Right. And we we're back at it. We've been training since then. And, you know, I was talking to one of the athletes on the team about it, Justin Fongsavon. Shout out Justin, great guy. I don't know if you've already had him on the podcast or not, but he, he'd be a great story. Um, I was talking to him about it. He was like, we're going to see in Tokyo who worked through the pandemic, mm. who really trained. This past year we had off, who trained? They'll, they'll perform the better. They'll perform better than the ones who slacked off. He's like, we'll see. And so I love that because like, I train, I'm here, I'm ready to go. Like, I, I but, feel- so But you didn't- but you didn't have access to a track that whole time. It wasn't, it wasn't, uh, I didn't, I wasn't even training on a track, but we were making the best out of the crappiest situation possible. No track to train at, no weight room. We're on the beach or at the parks. We're in my house. We're up and down my street. We're at anywhere we can find a place to train. And ultimately that's what it's about, right? Stuff happens in life. I got a, a crappy situation handed to me where I have access to nothing during the most important year of my life but we made it work. We used the situation and, and, and made the best out of it as a whole and ended up working on our favor because training on the beach and dialing in the form and dialing in little aspects of my, you know, of my running and my form that we wouldn't have been able to dial into if we were so focused on high jumping and long jumping mm -hmm. and the more, the sexier part of the track and field versus sort of ugly stuff, the stuff we don't love. You don't really think about all the time, but that were equally as crucial, if not more crucial to me being where I am today than like the actual long jumping and actual high jumping. So mm. altogether, it worked itself out. And I say everything happens for a reason. The pandemic happened for a reason. I wouldn't be the version of myself that I am today without it happening. And I'm just grateful we're slowly, you know, moving out of this and, and opening up again and things are coming back to normal and then preparing well, for Tokyo. Well, Ezra, you could argue you can argue a couple of things with this postponement, right? Which is just basically adding a year of, right, of training, which is if you're a young athlete, it's probably helpful. And if you're on the end of your career, it probably hurts you, right? But like you got a year to get bigger, stronger, faster, dial in, you know, this, this was a good year because, you know, you're not, unlike pro athletes that have been doing this for 10 years that have that memory, right of all that training that they've done over the years you're still learning these sports yeah and i thought that was that was really interesting and the way we scheduled and, and approached this year was different than many other years we just it was like a rebuilding phase we were like we take took a step back looked at everything and built from the ground up we built from the stuff that needed to be worked on that we had sort of overlooked in the past because we were so focused on you know the actual, the form of the jumps and the actual, uh, you know, all that sort of stuff, the stuff that might seem like it might be more important, but in reality, the very little stuff, the stuff that you barely even notice that makes the biggest difference. So we just built from the ground up. So then now as we're approaching, you know, Tokyo and trials and these big competitions, 
the framework's there. The you know the concrete is put it's set in. It's on the ground. We're mm-hmm. just playing around with the the topical stuff, the stuff mm-hmm. that can change like that, right? That but the the framework, the stuff, the meat that we've been working on is is stuck. So yeah, and you know, as you admitted earlier, you hardly had trained for the hundred, and you're in the finals at World Championships two years yeah. ago. So it's kind of funny. Um, yeah, exactly. And Tokyo will be a test, right, to see how far you can take uh, the training you got this last year. What's the the next step in terms of making the the team for Tokyo? What you know, kind of what's going on over the next few months? Yeah, the uh, the trials for the 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 Paralympic trials are June fifteenth, I think. June fifteenth, June seventeenth, one of those days, somewhere in June. But yeah, Maybe. so there's some sometime in June. There's the the Paralympic trials. Um, to see who makes a team, whoever performs the best there, the top 60 athletes, they go. And, you know, you don't show up on the day, you don't go. I am, I'm very well prepared and, and, you know, I'm, I'm very confident in my ability that I, I, I know I will make the team. I know I will um, be, have my name called on the roster, but uh, yeah, ultimately nothing matters about what you're going to do in Tokyo unless you make the team. So it's just step-by-step. Step. And then, you know, once you make the team, you know, you go back, you reassess, and you've got a few months before the games. And so this is all just tuning and tightening up. And, you know, we're not doing anything too crazy and making crazy changes. We're just fine tuning things right now. Mm-hmm. Um, and then ultimately leading up to the games and leading up to trials, it'll, uh, you know, it's just sharpening the tools. So I'm prepared. I'm excited. You know, it's, I love competing. It's going to be a fun competition, more pressure, more on the line. People are going to perform better. So I'm happy to be there, excited to, to compete. So what would you say your, your short, medium, and long-term goals are in sport? Like specifically related to sport or could it like? Yeah. yeah. Okay. My, my short-term goal, I'm considering it short-term because it's this summer, which is I'm just considering Tokyo. Mm-hmm. Um, my, my short-term goal is to to walk away, walk away from Tokyo with multiple medals, um, which I think I'm hundred percent capable of. And I know for, for a fact will happen. I, I, I'm confident in my ability that I, I will walk away from Tokyo, um, with, with multiple medals around my neck, whether that be two, whether that be three, you know, in all of my events that is up for interpretation and up, up for, up to the, the spirits above the, to figure out what happens. But, but I, I know for a fact, I'll be walking away with multiple medals. And, um, and then on top of that, as far as like my, my long-term goals, it's uh, I want to become the most dominant Paralympic champion there has ever been in history in all three of my events. I want to get to the point where at the LA 28 games, I'm winning these competitions by so much. It's not even fair. It doesn't even, it doesn't even look the competition anymore. You know, because it's it's so set in stone that I'm going to win. I want to be winning the hundred meter by two seconds. I want to be long jumping a meter farther than everyone else. I want to be high jumping almost a whole foot higher than the other. I want to be destroying everyone by so much that it's like not even close anymore. And then, you know, real, somewhat related to sports, I want to be, you know, one of the biggest, one of the biggest global athlete superstars in the world, and basically take the Paralympic movement and. uh expand it to the mainstream media, expand it to, to people who didn't even know what it was and didn't understand how competitive it was. Cause I think it's, it's, it's definitely marketable. It's hundred percent marketable dudes with blades running really fast on the track. Mm-hmm. And so I want to be the guy to sort of, you know, take the movement and, and just expand and show people everywhere and, and bring tons of media and press. And, you know, who knows how I do that? Who knows what way I, what way I take the movement in, whether it's, you know, by my athletic performance, or maybe I even go into mainstream media and then, you know, bring it, who knows what it's going to be and who knows how it's going to happen, but I, I'm going to um, expand the movement and, and grow it by exponential amounts. But yeah, short-term goal. I'll be walking away from Tokyo, no doubt with multiple medals, most likely three. And so, uh, so w- when you talk about sort of that global role that you want to play, um, why? What's the what's the real intent behind it? I think that the Paralympic movement and the Paralympic Games can offer so much to the world, so much to so many people and can impact so many lives. But it just doesn't have the exposure. 
And you mm-hmm. think about the UFC, right? They had this one guy who sort of grew it like exponent grew it exponentially and Conor McGregor. You have maybe the Olympics or track and field as a sport that was grown exponentially by Usain Bolt. You have all these 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 once in a generation athletes that whether because their persona or whether because their actual talent or whatever, whatever it might be, they are able to take something, take a sport, take an event, take an organization and just expand it to the world, expand it to the mainstream media and, 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 and turn it into something huge. And um, I feel that, that I have the, what it takes, I have, you know, I have what it takes to do that for the Paralympic movement. I, I have what it takes to, to do that same thing for, for Paralympic sport, for the adaptive movement and, and do that globally, not necess- not even just in the U S but become, you know, turn the Paralympics into what the Olympics are, turn it into a global event that is capturing eyes from all across the world. So I, I, I know I have the capability to do that. And ultimately it starts with my athletic performance after I, after I win a medal in each of my events in Tokyo, and I come back and we do the same thing in Paris, except with all gold. And then we do the same thing in LA, except with world records. And then on top of that, we're doing lots of media and we're, you know, I, I have what it takes. And I know I, I will do what is necessary to, to become that athlete for the Paralympic movement. So. I love it. But what, what my question though, is a little bit on like, what's the, what is the positive impact on society that you're driving towards here? Well, it, it, it inspires not only, not only does it inspire other kids with physical disabilities, that there is a future, there is a career for them. You know, there is this sort of, there's the top of, the top of the line athletics for them, right? Which, you know, many don't know is even possible. Um, the Paralympic stories and the idea of the games inspires so many people, um, able-bodied and disabled across the world. I mean, I get hundreds of DMs of people saying how inspirational I am. And I only have like 20,000 followers. Imagine if all the top guys in the Paralympics had like millions and millions of followers. Imagine the amount of you know, imagine the amount of lives that would be changed because of, because of the platform that they would have. And mm-hmm. so it just baffles me that there isn't more attention around the Paralympics the, and, and the athletes involved. And, you know, there's top athletes who have barely a thousand followers on Instagram right. and, or a barely, barely much of a, a platform. And so I want to change that completely. And by me, you know, gaining a huge platform, I'm then bringing more eyes that my competitors, the other people within the Paralympics can sort of build their own platforms and, and feed off of what I'm doing. So by, by what I'm going to be, end up doing, it's going to all feed and be, you know, this circle of this circle of, uh, of media, it's going to constantly be going back and forth and lives going to be changed and inspired because the, the idea of the Paralympics is, is ultimately going to be inspiring so many people. So that's, that's ultimately what the goal is about. And the reason I'm so passionate about it yeah. is because I, I know what it's capable of doing to inspiring so many. So, yeah, I love that. I love it. I'd like to take a quick break to show you how you can get involved as a volunteer with Angel City Sports. Are you interested in supporting Angel City Sports? We're seeking volunteers to help organize clinics and events, as well as support our athlete outreach efforts, marketing and media, and even fundraising and development. All skill sets and backgrounds are welcome in support of our mission to provide free adaptive sport opportunities for children, adults, and veterans with physical disabilities or visual impairments. For our younger athletes, we welcome you to join the Angel City Youth Leadership Council. Middle and high school age students are eligible to join the Youth Leadership Council, where you will learn about the disabled community by working side by side with our athletes and acquire important skills such as teamwork, leadership, philanthropy, and event management. To sign up for our volunteer newsletter and stay up to date on all upcoming opportunities, visit angelcitysports.org. What's something that uh, that I don't know about you that's interesting, intriguing? Oh man, that's tough. Something that you don't know about me. I don't know how much I say this actually, this, but I, I don't think I've ever said this before. I don't like doing things for extended periods of time because I get distracted and start thinking about track and field. <laughs> what does that mean? Like, you don't like, like movies, movies, um, hanging out with friends, school, whatever it might be. I cannot go 
that long without <laughs> having it something like relate back to tr- think about track and field. So we're thinking about running or high jumping or long jumping, not, not track and field, just my, my three events, obviously, but like, yeah. you know, I, I don't love what like, I I was watching. I was watching movies with the friends and I'm or even just being around my friends. And I'll just be like every two or three minutes or so. I'm just out. I'm out of it. I'm just thinking. <laughs> you know what I mean? So I don't say that very often, but I, I, don't, I don't know if you knew that or not. But. I didn't know that. It was super funny. I it doesn't shock me. Uh, but um, all right. So what, what has your disability taught you? My disability has taught me a lot um, about the impact that, uh, that I'm able to make in, in other people's lives just by having that self-confidence that you guys instilled with me when I was younger. Because I think that when people see a kid with one leg or anyone, this is, goes across the board, anyone with a physical disability, when they are able to carry themselves in a way and they're able to, to talk about something that seems so traumatic and seems so taboo, when they're able to talk about it in a very positive way and flip that sort of negative connotation that is associated mm-hmm. with it and use it as something positive, use it to their advantage, use it to, you know, to inspire other people. I think my disability has just taught me not even just about myself, but about the, like how, like when, what I think is what I think about. Someone has a physical disability. They have this golden ticket. They have this thing that very few people are ever going to be able to experience like them. And they're able to use it in so many ways to inspire so many people, to educate so many people, to do so much good with it. But it's just the way that they look at it, right? The same way that they can look at that golden ticket as a huge negative that's, and feel selfish about it. And, oh, they're, it's so bad for me and it's you know hurting me. And it's so difficult to do this, so difficult to do that. Or they can flip it and be like, wow, I have this gift. I have this something that I can use to help other people, mm-hmm. right? That's bigger than myself, right? Because with, with disability, the stuff that I want to do and the, my goals and dreams about helping others and, you know, changing perceptions, that, that's, that has nothing to do with me. Whether it's me who does it, whether it's another athlete, whether it's, you know, whoever it might be, I don't care. I don't have to have this big name to get that done. All I care about is, is the actual impact that's being made. And so once someone can harness that golden ticket, harness that specific thing, that disability, you know, and and use it to their advantage, you know, it makes, it can inspire so many people. I mean, you hear about all the time, you see someone who, a girl who's missing an arm playing the piano and you're like, wow, like that's so inspiring. I have two hands and I, I love the piano and you have this, like, that's so cool. There's so many little things, right. That can, so many little, you know, things that people can be inspired by just you know, for someone having a physical disability and, and carrying themselves and using that golden ticket in a positive way. So that's what, that's what disability is taught me. I mean, it's taught me, first of all, it's taught me so many things about myself, about, you know, getting through the dark periods of my life and, you know, not letting, you know, other people judge you and, and not worrying about other people's opinions. And because people are going to underestimate you all the time. And there's all that stuff that I've said, throughout my entire life, but this, this little idea that, that I just sort of thought of right now, but I, I, or I just sort of vocalized right now, but I thought about it for a while is just like, you know, we have this golden ticket. We have this amazing mm-hmm. opportunity mm-hmm. as someone with a physical disability to use that as a positive to inspire others. And then in some cases, it might be inspiring another person with a physical disability who then inspires another person and then inspire, well, it just, it's this yeah. snowball effect, but we really were, I was really, I truly think of it like I was blessed with this opportunity to help so many other people. And I just got to stop thinking of it as myself. Like, Oh, why me? No, like, thank you. Like I'm happy. It's me because I can use it to help other people. So. All right. So that that's beautiful. Yeah. You haven't talked about the golden ticket. So that's, that's a new one. I like it. Um, It's related to my next question, which is sort of what, what have you learned about self-acceptance or like, what's that journey been like to truly accepting yourself? I mean, let's say if we're being real, the journey to self-acceptance is not easy at all. And it never comes in like this one moment where you're just like this revelation where you're just like, oh, and you accept yourself. It's, I mean, maybe for some people, but for me personally, it took a while. And granted, I'm very young. And so I'm grateful to have even got to, gotten to a point where I'm able to accept myself this young. But um you know, when I was four years old, when I was five years old, when I was young, I, I talked about a little bit earlier, but I was really sad. I was like, why am I the only person in school with one leg? 
why did this have to happen to me? Why me? Why me? All, all that stuff. And it took lots of time, right? Because it, it, and, but once I got to the point where I just realized, I was like, I was born this way. There's literally nothing I can do to change the situation. There's nothing I can do to change it. I might as well just make the most out of my life. And so once I began to thinking, thinking about the fact that things aren't happening, you know, they think when things happen, some stuff I'm unable to control. Some stuff is out of my, I'm not going to be concerned about everything that happens in my life. When things happen, I just make the most out of the situation, right? So that goes back to the point that I was talking about way earlier about, you know, the stuff that happens that with my prosthetic leg and little challenges like that. I know that some stuff is inevitable. It's going to happen. I just make the most out of the situation. I try to avoid that. So self-acceptance came for me when I realized that I had no point in sulking in the sadness and, and wallowing in this state of depression and why me and feeling sorry for myself because there was nothing I could do to change it. So the only way I would, the only way I would end up enjoying my life is if I learned to say, you know what? I was born this way. Nothing I can do. It's going to make the most out of the, my life, make the most out of the situation, which ultimately across the board, whether you have a physical disability or not, there's going to be some stuff that's out of your control. It happens. You just make the most out of the situation. And ultimately that little, that little flip, that little thing that took me a while to really figure out applies universally to my life and now allows me to get through things with, you know, a lot more ease than I would have if I hadn't been through that real spiritual journey where I really learned like, Hey, I was born this way. Nothing I can do about it. Might as well just make the most out of my situation. So. Yeah. Love that. Uh, all right. So this might be a hard one for you, but what have you learned? And just cause you're so young, uh, what have you learned from your mistakes or failures or even any regrets? Like, and like, what did, what did you do? What have you done to sort of get past that? Yeah, that's a tough, it's a tough question because mistakes, especially depending on how meaningful they are to you can be really difficult to get past and really difficult to just sort of brush aside. And I don't think necessarily brushing aside past mistakes is the right attitude or the right way to go. Because at the end of the day, mistakes are, are what make us human. And these mistakes ultimately help you, you know, learn and become a better person moving forward. I've made so many mistakes in my life. So many, whether that be in school, whether that be in a relationship, whether that be around friends, whether that be on the track, whether that be about, you know, stuff that's going on when I'm training and stuff there, I've made so many mistakes, but each mistake has helped me, has helped me grow, helped me learn. And ultimately each mistake is the reason that I am the person that I am today. If I hadn't made that mistake of overtraining in when I was in sixth grade, I wouldn't have broken my femur. I wouldn't have learned to manage my stress and manage my load. And I wouldn't have avoided injuries for the past almost four years, I haven't really had much of an injury because right. I've learned how to manage it. I've learned how to take care of my body. There's, you know, if I hadn't made the mistake one time or whatever, in whatever grade of not turning in this homework assignment, I wouldn't have learned that I needed to create an organized planner and learn to go through it step-by-step step. like mistakes, brushing them aside and acting like they didn't happen or is, is never going to end up affecting you positively because how are you going to learn from it? So making mistakes and stuff that happens in my life, it happens. I can't, I don't want to, I don't want to stress about the outcome of it. That's why I, I don't want to stress about the repercussions or the outcome, but I do want to learn from what happened. So yeah. I don't make it again. So it doesn't happen again. And high jump, you hit the bar with your foot. That's a mistake. You don't want to just brush it aside, act like it didn't happen because you might do that again. You want to be conscious about not stressing about the fact that you had done it, but learning from it and being like, all right, I'm going to lift my leg up this time. And you lift your leg up, you clear it. And that's yep. how you keep moving forward. So, yeah, I love that. I love it. Um, before I ask that, I have a couple more questions in the soul strip, but I want you to share a little bit about the experience in Peru at the Pan American Games and really how you and Sam sort of, you know, kind of who's your mentor, right? Uh, talking about Sam Grew, high jumper, and kind of how you guys pulled off what you pulled off going one, two in the high jump. Uh, it's just, just, I love that story. Yeah, the, sto the story of Peru is pretty amazing. Um, I went to Peru and I was competing against adults for the first time of my entire life. And I was very nervous. I was very anxious. It was super scary. 
And a few days before the competition, you know, the world record holder, the number one guy who I was jumping with, a mentor, Sam Grew, he told me, he said, do everything I do for the next two days and we will go one, two. And so, you know, I did everything he did. I ate when he ate. I stretched when he stretched. We talked, whatever. Like I, I went through the whole routine that he did. And then he constantly kept reassuring me that this was going to happen, that I was going to, I was going to, I was going to get that silver medal right behind him. And that ended up happening exactly the way we had talked about it. Um, and it was, it was truly an amazing experience. It was super epic to be in front of, you know, 10,000 people, a, a roaring crowd, my family, you know, it was, it was one of those moments you'll never forget. And to do it alongside him, who's a mentor, a friend, you know, ultimately like a big brother to me, mm-hmm. it was one of those, one of those moments that, you know, I'll never forget. And, you know, preparing to replicate that in Tokyo. So it was an awesome experience for sure. I love that. Beautiful. Mm. I think I've been, I've been very blessed with the position that I'm in today and ultimately hope to be, you know, and I'm very blessed with the position I'm in today and ultimately where I will be within the next five to 10 years, but helping others and, uh, and sports and track and field are two th- are the, my two passions. I mean, there's many other things I'm passionate about, but those are the, the, the overarching theme because they connect, they connect, you know, they connect when I, bring, take the Paralympic movement, hopefully one day and, and expand it to mainstream media and, you know, raise the platforms of all these athletes that will be helping other people through sports. So they're very connected in what my dream and what my, my future will be. So. For sure. For sure. Uh, I love that. All right. Uh, we're almost done. Uh, what I like to do at the end of the show is give my guests, you know, the sort of the microphone to sort of wrap us up in style Um, so I want you to cover two things. One is just like something that whatever comes to mind that maybe you haven't said, you want to say people you want to acknowledge on the team and it could be anything, but like whatever pops to mind, you know, uh, that maybe you, you, you didn't cover yet. Um, and then just give people a sense of like where to find you, you know, uh, how can they, uh, follow your, your journey? Yeah. All right. Uh, First, and I guess the, the final thing I want to say um, is, is don't let anyone else tell you what you're capable of. To all the people listening out there, I've had many people who underestimated me, doubted me, counted me out my whole life, and it continues to happen to this day. Um, but not listening to those people and uh, you know, believing in yourself is, is arguably one of the most important things that, that you could do. And so for me, it's a continuous battle to not listen to those people who count you out, those people who underestimate you, don't believe in your potential, don't believe, you know, what's what don't believe necessarily what you believe you're capable of doing, Um, but not listening to those people working hard and and ultimately trusting the process and having this this strong belief in yourself that you can do anything and anything you set your mind to will outweigh those negative thoughts and that underestimating. So I'm dealing with that to this day. And uh, so just a real life example that no matter where you are in your life, that will continue to happen. There will continue to be people who who count you out, write you off and and don't think you're capable of what you think you're capable of. Um, So, you know, don't listen to those people and, uh, you know, always have that belief and and self-confidence in yourself. And then, you know, you can find me on Instagram at Team Ezra 5. We talked about that. Team Ezra 05 actually on all social media. Um, But, you know. That's that. I guess that's that's the perfect way to end it. Is just like belief in yourself and uh, put your mind to something. You can accomplish anything. You know, four years ago when I was 11 years old, um, I said I was going to be competing at the Tokyo 2020 Paralympic Games, and now I'm three months away from actually doing that. And so now I'm saying this stuff on Angel City podcast that sounds kind of crazy and sounds kind of out there, and people might not believe it, and you might not think it's possible. But at the end of the day. We'll look back in five to 10 years and you'll say, damn, that kid accomplished everything he said he was going to do. So, uh, well, listen, as it's been a, it's been a true pleasure, uh, spending the last hour ish with you. Um, thanks for your time. I know you're a busy kid. You've got <laughs> exams and social commitments and meets and this and that you got a lot going on in your life. Um, but just tremendously grateful for you, uh, the amazing son that you are for your mother and I, and the amazing brother and friend, uh, 
you are uh, to your, you know, your network uh, and the mentor and advocate and ambassador you are to the community and for all the work you put in to help us with Angel City and, you know, get the word out um, just from the bottom of my heart. Thank you for being you. And uh, I am sure we're going to do a follow up show after Tokyo uh, to, to unpack the experience in Tokyo. Uh, but uh, but listen, best of luck in Tokyo. Best of luck the the, the run of the season, and uh, I love you. And we'll uh, we'll talk soon. I love you, Dad. Thank you. Thank you for having me. And uh, see you in the living room in about three minutes. So, <laughs> what a great show that was with my own flesh and blood, my son Ezra Freck. Watch out for him in Tokyo this summer, and check out the show notes for ways to follow him. The next episode is Courtney Ryan and her circus act. You're not going to want to miss her story. This show is produced by Angel City Sports. Follow us on social media and sign up for emails if you'd like more information on being an athlete, volunteer, or supporter. My name is Clayton Freck, the host and executive producer of Sports Save My Life. The team behind the show includes Dave Pantano, our producer and editor, Mackenzie Soldan, who handles marketing, and Tony Memel, who wrote and performed our theme song. Thanks for listening.